Okay, so we're continuing reading the autobiography of Harry Vernet Rhodes. This is a book that was written in 1950, 51, uh, by the same author who first brought the famed psychic Edgar Cayce into the public eye. And it, this chapter talks about what happens at death. What are the adjustments that people have to make and what actually is happening on the other side? As this was told to Harry, who was my, grand, my great grandmother, about those who have actually made this journey. And she talks of how the consequences of the life you lived affects you on the other side and the challenges that face people in the afterlife because it is still a continuing journey toward becoming your best self over many lifetimes with a lot of time when you're not on earth and some that you are. So you know, this is different from what we normally hear. And yet from all the other things, this is what she experienced. So I just wanna share what was in the book. At times you might think that she wrote this, at least some of it, after watching the TV show, The Good Place. Yet this book was written some 70 years before that show was even thought about. So these themes that she tells seem to come up again and again. So let's start in here on chapter five, living through death. During these years of adventure, I learned to trust the promptings which came to me from my father and the other teachers and helpers from the other side. Perhaps the phrase, the other side is misleading. Even when we think of death as a doorway to a larger experience, because so far as space and time are concerned, the dead apparently have free access to our domain, or at least those who are appointed to definite tasks among the living have access to our experience and many others who choose to linger in our environment. On the other hand, many individualities appear not to linger with us, but progress to other dimensions of consciousness, maybe even to other localities of experience. Certainly not all the dead have what it takes to contact the living, any more than all the living people can make contact with those who have gone on. But some of those who are now living the larger life of unobstructed universe are teachers. They are able to guide those of us on earth who seek spiritual growth. This quest is a joint affair. Together, we are moving towards the light. They cannot progress without us. All the way from birth to death, from lifetime to lifetime, we are both being and becoming. Eastern philosophy calls this continuation process of growth karma. In the Christian tradition, we think of it as the phrase that Jesus said, as ye sow, so shall ye also reap. Those who have finished an earth span have a wider range of awareness than most persons alive seem to possess. Not all good people become wise merely by the act of dying. Goodness knows. But the good and wise seem to become even wiser. Yes, and even more good, because they can now appraise and verify their own wisdom. In effect, they say over and over again, it was as I thought, kindness and sympathy, generosity, justice, love, these qualities matter more than anything else. All progress is fostered by them. Indeed, in an immediate and dynamic sense, creative love is all that counts. I think there were some Beatles songs about that. Again, that was before her time too. These encounters often evidence that man does not so much live again as though he just keeps right on living, merely exchanging one form of matter for another or one rate of vibration for another. It was impressed on me that the spiritual body is a thing, a reality, just as sure as the physical body is. It has form and substance, although its vibrations are too high to be seen in ordinary circumstances. Customarily, it interpenetrates the physical body, but on some occasion, such as during sleep or in a trance, or when the physical is rendered unconscious by the anesthetic, it can release itself and be free in space. Its connection with the physical is apparently made through the endocrine system. When the endocrine system is out of balance, the spiritual body cannot activate the physical body for the best functioning of the total individual. 
Now, some people ask how two bodies can occupy the same space at the same time. But the answer, as I have received it from my teachers, appears to be that the spiritual interpenetrates the physical. Think of this as how a bucket of sand may also be filled with water. The water occupies the space between the grains of sand. My teachers indicate that the mind is an organ of the spiritual body manifesting through the brain. So it's an organ of the spiritual body, which is much different from how we're really taught about things. So when the brain is injured, the mind can no longer express itself normally. The mind can continue to have an intense awareness and can adapt to function through other means. In what we call death, the spiritual body lifts from the physical. It continues to function in a perfectly normal manner to the individual. I've often been astounded by the fact that the dead do not appear to be instantly aware that they are dead. To those of us who are watching, we see the physical functions stop abruptly. It appears so conclusive, so final, that it seems strange that the individual themselves is not instantly aware of this change. I heard about this immediate experience of death from many who have crossed over. Only later did I read about these traditions from other cultures and religions besides the Christian. One of the most delightful reports of awareness following death came from my own father. One day he wrote through my hand a brief account of his experience when he first left earth life. When I was first freed from my physical body, I found myself in a very different world from which my imagination had painted. At first, I did not know where I was, but soon located my body and later my family. It was some time before I realized that I was dead. Instead, I supposed I was dreaming. In fact, not until I saw my daughters take a trip to my home and watch my own body taken to the same place for burial, did I seriously study the situation. There I beheld my one-time friends and walked my children up the church aisle to take a last look at what had been for so long my house and what I had sometimes considered myself. Then I realized that I left the world I had known and had entered one in which I was invisible to those whom I loved, wished to help when I was alive on earth. I stood near my grave, disconsolately feeling a stranger in a strange land. I was suddenly aware that there stood near me someone who I had known long before. And he said to me, well, Henry, you didn't expect to meet me here, did you? I was very glad to meet my old friend, whom I had chummed in college. He informed me that he had become a teacher in this world and had been sent to care for me and show me how to live and work. He said, what you will do, you cannot tell so soon, but come with me and see your new home. I could not bear to leave my loved ones, and I told him so. And he said that if I learned to do the work given me, I could help those left behind and lead them to higher and better lives. Gladly, I went with him and learned what a grand work can be done by those who are willing. I have four daughters and one son living on earth, and I often stand near them, but only one of them can realize my presence. I tried for months before I made her realize that there was something for her to learn and a work for her to do for the future life but gradually she came into the right vibrations and has now developed sufficiently for me to write through her instrumentally. That is um, using the automatic writing. Her father continues, as to teachers, I have learned this. There are many, many planes on the side of death and as many teachers on each side through lack of understanding of psychic laws, much trouble arises. Here is an example. I sent my daughter to talk with an old friend of mine, and he said he had no use for such things, for he had known a man who spent all his fortune and lost his life looking for a gold mine which did not exist because a medium had lied to him. The father continues, there are mediums whose chief aim is gain for selfish purposes. These mediums tend to attract those teachers from this side who dwell on the earth plane of existence. The information they give is neither reliable nor uplifting. There are those, however, whose word is to be depended upon, 
for their purpose is honest and pure. And from a real desire to help, they are able to give material advice, which will make one more useful. They attract those on our plane whose desires during earth life were pure and true, but who through ignorance made little progress in real understanding. They find happiness by making others happier and thus learn the secret of true progress, which is unselfish love. The father's still talking. On our side, there are also those who have grown farther in spiritual enfoldment and those whose work is far removed from the material life that they can with difficulty come in contact with material affairs and never for material or selfish ends. They attract those mediums whose motives are pure and whose desires are unselfish and true. The more spiritual a man is, the more spiritual are those helpers that he attracts. Okay, this is me again. From this explanation, it sounds like attempting to tune into a broadcast radio station that you only get the channels that your antenna can receive. Even this explanation may sound archaic if you're too young to remember radio. Think of it like how the social media algorithms pay attention to what you look at and will only show you similar things. Either way, the idea is that those who have contact with the other side will have vastly different experiences, which may be why skeptics are not impressed by any of the results they see when they start looking. Many persons have the mistaken idea that a teacher is one who has complete control of the medium at all times and thus relieves the medium of all responsibility. Some mediums through ignorance feel that they are in no way responsible for what they give. This is a serious mistake. A medium should accept no spirit as a teacher until he has proved his truthfulness. The medium must himself be true for what he is largely determines what sort of teachers will be attracted to him. He should not lose his individuality, but allow his teacher to help him grow more spiritual and noble. Okay, so Henry Rhodes, Harry's father, is still continuing, he's still talking here. On the other hand, each person draws to himself those on his own plane in harmony with himself. Therefore, do not wonder if your messages are material or unrefined. If your desires are of a low order and your motives selfish, if you yourself are not true, do not blame the medium when you start to receive false statements. It matters not how much or how little education you have, all depends on what you are, good or bad, spiritual or materialistic, and what you aim to become. Keep your life pure and your thoughts noble. Desire the good of all, and then you may expect the good, true messages. No matter how great your purity or how high the master who wishes to use you for the purpose of uplifting, until you overcome all personal desires and make yourself subject to the greater good, you cannot be used to this advantage. However, the great musician, he cannot play as well on a poor instrument as on a good one. The teacher who is a true spiritual guide while growing higher himself is also seeking to draw others with him to teach them how to live and how to prepare for life's long future. We have others here who do the missionary work and teaching on this plane. Millions of souls come from the earth who know nothing of a future life. And these teachers spend their time teaching them how to live and grow from one plane to another. We are watching gladly the work of enlightenment on earth and are ready to do all we can to prove to you that we, are, that we really continue to live and more abundantly here than there. We aim to do all that we can to help people to realize that God is spirit and we are his children made in his image, having eternal life. When men realize that they live forever and how grand life really is, they will rise above the earthly life and walk with us. Where to live is joy and the watchword is progress for ourselves and others. We strive to teach that to live truly is to rise above a life of error and grow in harmony with all truth rising higher and higher into the life of pure spirit. Realize that you are already spirit. You will have gone on this road of life before you leave the physical body. 
and this long letter was signed John Henry Rhodes. Now we're back to Harry talking again. The following letter from my father tells about his work on the other side. It has come to me that if people on the earth plane could see some of the scenes which are common in my work, it would be a great help to them in their daily life. My work is that of a guide. On earth, I might be called a missionary. And on that term, may be more easily understood by some who read this message. My duty is to meet those entrusted to my care as they come from earth life, to show them how to live and see that they are comfortably located and given work whereby they may grow and also help others. Perhaps a few cases which I have met will give you a better idea of what this life is like. There are some who have lived on earth, a life of formalism, where everything was done in some special religious form without the spirit behind it. There is really no harder class to help than these people for they cannot think or understand that the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. I remember a lady who had been accustomed to repeating proper forms of prayers without once thinking of their meaning and the difficulty I had in rousing her attention enough so she would listen to me. She knew she had passed through some change, but did not know exactly what had happened. If you could have seen the joy on her face when she realized that life is not made of empty words, but of real living deeds. And had you been able to follow her through her work of saving those who had been in the same darkness as herself, you would have learned a lesson you could never forget. The lesson is so seldom taught on earth that one pure desire is more fruitful than a lifetime of mere forms. And you know, by forms, he means going through the motions, that many are held back by the belief that a certain number of prayers per day will be all that they need. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, and that is what brings results into life. Another case was of a man who had been considered a bad man because he did not live up to all the rules taught to him by his priest. He came here with a thought, of course, that he must go into a lake of dreadful fire for he had not been able to keep up his church duties. I found him cowering in a dark place, waiting to be born into hell. And I said to him, friend, why are you here in this manner? After an amazing silence, he told me what had happened in his expectation. I saw in his life much that was very good, many kind deeds, and above all, the loving spirit that had helped the helpless and those in trouble, expecting no return, but the knowledge that some were made happier. When he saw that his old fears were a mistake, that living love in life, not the outward form, is what counts, his joy was wonderful, and he is doing all that he can to bring that knowledge to others. Again, there comes to mind a soul who considered himself far better than other people. He had been an autocrat on earth, and when he came here, he looked around for his servants and was about to order someone to wait upon him. No one could convince him that he was one of the poorest and most desolate souls, for his whole life had been one of selfishness, and he knew nothing of the joy of living for others. The Christ-like spirit of love was a mere name to him, and there he had to stay in a barren spot, waiting for a time when he could have a desire to do something good for someone else. For only by doing for others and forgetting self could he grow upwards. Among the others was a woman who had always given her life to help others in distress and had spent little thought on herself. She had known that she was God's child and had trusted him to take care of her. But when she was shown her new home and saw all the beauty and harmony which had been placed there by her loving life on earth, she cried, oh, indeed, my soul is satisfied. There was the music for which her soul had longed, but which she had been too busy to get. There, the beautiful paintings, the harmony of life, which no mortal can comprehend, the outgrowth of a sweet life lived on earth. Contrast this spirit mansion with a house created by a life of self-seeking, and no one would for a moment wish to exchange one for the other. How cheerless and barren the home made by the selfless deeds and thoughts. Could people only see the houses their lives of pleasure-seeking and materialism built? 
they would at once exchange their mode of living. The statement that your life builds you a home is perhaps new and strange to you, but let me tell you, it is nevertheless true. All your thoughts and actions are entering into the character which you are building and which will determine what sort of dwelling you will inhabit in your future life. It is only by having the Christ spirit in your lives that you can build the right kind of houses. He lives in your hearts and by his constant leadership, his tender love and fellowship, he teaches you the lessons of life and love, which is embodied in his two great commands. Thou shalt love the Lord, thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And the second is, like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love is the fulfilling of the law. How beautiful your heavenly home will be if you filled it with love and gratitude of those whom you helped on earth. Far different will it be if it was made by selfishness and ornamented with an array of unused opportunities and sorrows and tears caused by your carelessness and lack of love. Let those thoughts of the future life influence your life on earth, that you may be transformed into the likeness of him who came to teach you how to live. Let the same spirit be in you, which is in Jesus Christ, that you may be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And in so doing so, you will be fitted for a life of usefulness and beauty in the life to come, which is but a continuance of your present life. Signed, John Henry Rose.